Doesn't matter whether it's England, America, Italy, Japan. Doesn't matter. You get a bird up there pulling her knickers down and it's something they all understand. Well, it's logical, isn't it? I mean, which would you rather see? An arty, crafty film or a bloody great pair of tits? <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Reprobate Podcast. My name's David Flint. Today I'm talking to David Miguelavray, screenwriter and author and long-time anti-censorship campaigner. David's responsible for films as varied as House of Whipcord, Satan's Slave, Frightmare and Trouser Bar. He's also written Doing Rude Things, the definitive study of British sex films and his own rather scandalous autobiography. So let's get started. David, how are you? Well, I'm okay, I suppose, really. I mean, it's very nice to talk to you, so I'm in uh, quite a good mood today. But, you know, if you were to ask me tomorrow, I might be doing nothing in particular and bored and worried about the future, and I'd be in a completely different mood. Um, But then, you know, we're all in the same boat, as people keep saying. And mm. um, it's just another cliche. The trouble is that everything has been said about this crisis over and over again. It's tremendously difficult to find anything else new to say. So let's hope we manage it, eh? I, th- I think so. How's, how's your lockdown been? Well, it was a novelty to begin with. Um, I remember watching our dear leader's uh, address to the nation, and he said, you've got to stay indoors for three weeks. And uh, I I Mm. wrote in my diary that night, three weeks, how will I ever manage it? (laughs) Um, But the first uh, three weeks were, um, you know, quite fun because it was new and different. But are we now talking, it's getting on for three months, isn't it? (laughs) It it must and be. I mean, I, I'd, I'd stopped counting. I think we started a week before people for various reasons, and I got to week twelve, and then I stopped counting. Yes, one day is very much like another, isn't it? And uh, mm. so weekends blur into weekdays, and which end is up? You know, basically, yes, I've had I've had enough, but um, mm. I try and I try and remain positive. Well, it feels it feels almost as though the whole lockdown is just collapsing in on itself anyway, for one reason or another. I can vouch for that um, because um, social distancing seems to be a, a thing of the past, at least where I live. Um, but the parks are crawling with uh, with people who are not observing it anymore. And there seems to be no policing of it um Mm. whereas in the in the first couple of weeks you know we were watching tv and there were cops outside the station saying is your journey really necessary sir (laughs) and (laughs) that that's that's all gone and uh, i was on public transport on saturday in fact and uh, you know Uh. although masks masks are obligatory well not everyone was wearing one. No, we were actually having this discussion earlier today. Just you know, the bus driver is not not really going to stop the bus and march up and down demanding people put a mask on, is he? <laughs> no, and there's 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 get out clauses as well. Uh, so mm. if you've got if you've got asthma, then you you're not uh, required to wear one. So no, no one is going to dare go up to say. To say somebody put your mask on and then get into an embarrassing situation. Mm. It's a, it's 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 it appears to be unpoliceable, but I think people knew that to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things that always depends on on consensus, and I don't know whether it's that people get less scared because this time goes on, or whether they just become more complacent. But all the panic seems to go, and they just want to get out. And... It would appear so. Yes, um, that 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 time has passed. Um, so we've got to get to a, a stage whereby there's general agreement that uh, th- this has to stop. And we still have to maintain some kind of sense about the whole thing. 
Mm. Uh, let's see if we can reach that balance. Because this all happened, you were just about to, to launch a new project or start work, I guess, on your on your next film. Well, of course, all work stopped almost overnight. I had uh, two shows that were about to tour. They were cancelled immediately, uh, along with my income. Uh, I, I now have virtually none. So all I can do is, is work on promoting a couple of projects, in fact. One is, is the film that I should have been shooting now, and the other one is this extraordinary project, Trouser Bar the Musical. I mm. suppose that would need some explanation for people who haven't heard of Trouser Bar. But So I've got two projects that keep me semi-busy. Well, now that you've brought Trouser Bar up, shall we, shall we discuss what Trouser Bar is, as you say, for those who, who might be unfamiliar with the phenomenon? <laughs> shall we dismiss that first? Yes, well, they are linked, in fact, um, the uh, musical and uh, the film which you mentioned. Um, so round about, I think it was 2015, I was uh, getting into an enormous trouble with the John Gielgud Charitable Trust because they didn't want me to show a film. And uh, we still can't talk about the reason why. Anyway, um, palms were, gr were greased and the film did open at uh, BFI South Bank um, here, uh, here in London. I can't remember whether you were at that screening, were you? I was. You were? <laughs> okay, well, you'll remember yeah. perhaps. That, uh, oh, after, well. after <laughs> oh, good. After the film, uh, I was up on stage with um, uh, others involved in the production. I think somebody said, what are you doing next? And I said, I'm about to um, do something that will make Trouser Bar look like, um, I probably said, Watership Down. That's what I normally say. And, and that project, which was just in its infancy at that time, was a film of Robin Maugham's novel, The Wrong People. Mm. So I, I thought I thought that would get me into enormous trouble as well because of the theme of the novel. But um, we haven't as yet managed to, to put that into production and there's no confirmation about when uh, film production will begin again in this country. It's beginning mm. to look extremely likely that uh, it won't be this year now. Really? I'm afraid so. I guess it's very hard to to adhere to social distancing rules uh, if, you're, if you're making a film, no matter you know the best will in the world, certainly for something, uh, something like your project. Well, it's absolutely impossible, uh, in fact. So you, you can't make normal films anymore uh, unless you're Netflix and you can um, test the entire cast and crew, put them into quarantine before and after the shoot, and then you can have, you know, old school uh, physical contact. Um, there's a lot of that in our film, and it, it's going <laughs> to be absolutely impossible to do uh, unless, um, you know, social distancing is relaxed. And mm. it's look, looking increasingly likely that uh, it won't be until quite late into next year. Um, already it, it looks as though there'll be no uh, theatres open until next spring. Mm. Um, so, you know, this is why occasionally I get a bit depressed. Well, yeah, understandably. And then, you know, when we come out into this brave new world, uh, will you be allowed to make films that have physical contact in any way? I mean, it seems that these kind of these kind of things are disapproved of more and more at the moment. Absolutely true. Yes, it's impossible to know what the brave new world will look like. People are only theorising. Um, uh, all I hope is that you know there's going to be no more uh, isolation drama in which people in separate buildings look at the camera <laughs> because I'm I can tell you right now I've I've had enough of that. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's that point when you watch TV and every other commercial is just something for a bank where they've all filmed it from home looking very jolly and happy. And you think, oh, you know, surely somebody must have looked at this and thought, hang on, it's been done enough now. People don't need reminding that they can't go out. 
Yes, I think so. I absolutely agree. After three months, yes, we, we, we've got the message. Um, but, but yes, after, let's say, uh, a year, are, are people going to be um, completely used to the, the new style of drama in which mm. nobody touches each other? Now, mm. there's a thing. Has anyone even discussed that possibility? Um, you you know you 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 look at you look at old films and TV programs in which there's you know a crowd of people in a room and they're mm. shaking hands <laughs> and kissing <laughs> each, each other on the cheek and it seems like another era, doesn't it? Already, it seems mm. so old-fashioned. You've implied that your next film might. A bit like Trouser Bar, have a certain degree of, um, shall we say, physical contact between people. That seems to be disapproved of as well. <laughs> yes, yes, we're talk we're talking uh, simulated sex, which um, uh, yes, there will be a fair amount of that if we're allowed. And uh, you know, as I say, who knows whether this is going to be allowed? Uh, exciting times. I wish somebody would give us uh, some guidance soon, please. You think maybe we'll just have to look back on those uh, those shameful films of the 70s <laughs> that have recently but, been yes. exposed as the height of filth or the depth of filth, however you want to look at it. Well, of course, we're in a, a cleft stick because those are unacceptable as well. Um, we're referring, of course, to an, an article in the in the Daily Mail in which um, a, a feminist disapproved of the fact that the likes of Confessions of a Window Cleaner was being offered on Amazon um, because, you know, surprise, surprise, films like this are <laughs> crass and, and demeaning to women. Well, um, excuse me, I mean, I think we were aware of that while they were being made in the 1970s. <laughs> or while you it, were making them. Was, and while I, well, actually, while I was involved in the production of some of them, um, but of course, you know that the point is being missed completely because, uh, as I've pointed out before, not only were women stereotypes, men were stereotypes as well, as were foreigners and <laughs> and homosexuals. Everybody was a ridiculous caricature. <laughs> that was Which the point. That. That's British comedy for you. Yeah, I mean, I guess even at the time, everybody involved in those things must have been aware that these are, as you say, stereotypes, they're cliches, they're exaggerations. It's not supposed to be a documentary. <laughs> no, no, far, far from it. And that, the, that was the spirit of uh, not just British comedy, but farce the world over mm. you know that's what farce thrives on exaggeration these are not real people mm. um, and now it, it, it's quite fascinating as i've said in the latest edition of my book doing rude things to look back and realize what we found funny in those days yes okay it's not funny now comedy mm. doesn't tend to cross the generations very little comedy does and it's quite interesting from an academic point of view to to look back on what kinds of films were extremely popular. And there's no question about the fact that some of these films were. Yeah, I mean, I guess comedy has to reflect the time it's made in, doesn't it? Because it, it's speaking to the audience that exists at that point. Yes, and, and, that, and that's why it tends n not to, to cross generations, you know. Generally, the only kind of comedy that, that does is, is silent comedy. So... Uh, the, that's why we still think that Buster Keaton is very funny, but he's a rarity, you know. Uh, even the comedians who were popular at the time British sex comedy was popular, people like Morecambe and Wise, I mean, even even they, uh, eyebrows are being raised now uh, about some of their comedy. And it's also, it seems that comedy is one of those very national things, isn't it? You know, the, the British comedies didn't travel elsewhere, German sex comedies, French sex comedies, Italian sex comedies, all just spoke to their own countries, by and large. It, it, it's absolutely true, yes. We, we saw very little comedy from other countries in, in the UK. I can remember only a handful of examples on, on British TV when I was growing up, because we just didn't get 
their humour. I remember mm. for some reason there was a Dutch comedian who got a British TV series. Don't ask me his name now. It's lost <laughs> in the mists of time. But it was very strange by our standards. I, I don't think that series was recommissioned. <laughs> <laughs> do, what do you make of the current situation of rather more recent comedies now being pulled from Netflix or from the BBC archives or at least given assorted warnings before we see them? Well, it was inevitable we were going to get onto this topic, of course. Um, it's, it's very current at the moment and... Um, of course, well, I mean, I despair because, uh, you, you know, generally speaking, we cannot censor our past. It's, it's a pointless activity. So we're speaking uh, specifically about um, uh, 40 Towers, um, mm -hmm. more recently uh, Little Britain and the, the League of Gentlemen. Um, yeah. I mean, again everything has already been said in in each of those examples the people concerned were not making fun of uh, of uh, minorities um they were making fun of the people who make fun of minorities mm -hmm. and as i believe john clee said if if people can't see that then why was the comedy commissioned in the first place? Uh, I think people are being immensely stupid in this respect. And I gather that um, this ban on, on Faulty Towers has now been rescinded. <laughs> yes, I think either they've edited it or they're giving contextual warnings, aren't they now? Oh yes, we always we always need warnings, uh, and uh, some of them are, are, are going into overkill. There's a film called um, The Dam Busters, and you know what I'm going to say. The N-word yes. is, is in it, and it, it's in it all the way through, because that was the name of the campaign. So you, you can't edit it out. But they haven't been able to ban the film. So when it's, I mean, it's still shown on, on television with, with a warning at the front. But a friend of mine told me, um, that it was shown at some august cinema, probably BFI South Bank. So uh, there was an enormous introduction just about um, the fact that, you know, attitudes have changed, a, a word will be used in this film. And, you know, then there was an expert who came on and explained the context. And... By, my, my friend said that by the time, you know, the word turned up for the first time, I'm afraid there was laughter. And, yeah. you know, that surely was not the intention. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you can possibly just give people a little heads up saying, by the way, this film was made at this point, set at this period of time when people said things that we wouldn't say now. But. but aren't we all so aware of that now? Is there none mm. of us who don't know this? You know, if, if you're interested in watching old films, and a lot that I've never seen are to turning up on uh, a channel called Talking Pictures, it, <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a bit <laughs> of a worry that words are being dropped from the soundtrack. I mean, not only mm. is there a, war a warning at the front. Of everything then, they show. You know, virtually, <laughs> of course. But then the most extraordinary words are being dropped for, for no real reason. I don't know whether we're allowed to use the word Japs on this podcast, but you certainly aren't on talking pictures, it seems. Really? It's true. I only see little bits of talking pictures here and there and do very much enjoy what what they're doing but I, I notice that they are quite censorial before a certain time even if the film they're showing is a 1960s movie that has a pg certificate they'll still edit bits out yes they're they're um i suppose as, as worried about everybody else as about lo losing their license but they, yeah. they go to the most extraordinary extremes. A, a, a film, I'd, if I knew I was going to talk about this, I would have prepared, but I cannot remember what it is. But it was made around 1941, 
and um, Mervyn Johns goes into a bookshop and there's a, a nudie magazine on, on the top shelf. You know, the, it would have been called a photo studies magazine in, in those <laughs> days. And the, the front cover of the magazine is blurred. Was there any need? I mean, I suppose they're just, as you say, they're very scared, aren't they? So they err on the side of caution because Ofcom can turn around and say, well, that's no longer acceptable at this time, even though they don't. I know because I've checked that they don't have a blanket ban on nudity before 9 p.m., but nobody would dare show it. Now, you, you know more about the, the regulations than, than I do. And, uh, yes, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. Of course, I mean, because uh, of my interest, uh, lifelong interest in uh, censorship and, and free speech. Uh, it's always going to be a talking point as far as the British are concerned. I mean, free speech is one of those weird things now that whenever you say free speech, you, you get lumped in with the alt-right it seems whereas free speech when i was growing up i'm sure that when you were younger free speech was very much a left-wing issue definitely yes yes well well the the times they are changing and that and that's that's how it should be but back in the day there wasn't the amount of confusion that there is now about what you can and can't say and i think that this is the, the main trouble we're in now. You do not know if you can open your mouth or not, um, as mm. far as you know, the, me- the media is concerned. And this is all to do with um, some very vocal activists. And mm. I think they, they have to give us uh, some credit because uh, back in the day, things were much more straightforward. So... Um, obviously, we've moved on because of the great liberation movements of mm. of the 1960s, and and that is uh, black people, women, and uh, gay men and lesbians. But of course, that was necessary, and everybody knew at that time who everybody was talking about and referring to. But now we're getting into an area that we've never got into before, and that is is transphobia, and it's uh, as, yes. uh, it's a hot potato because it's confusing. I'm not the only w- one I know who has had to learn new language. I mean, when I was young, everybody knew what a woman was. Everybody knew <laughs> what a black person was. Uh, but now we're not sure about a non-binary person. Uh, mm. We're not sh- sure what a cisgender person is. Well, I mean, I'm I'm learning gradually, but it's mm. because of that that we don't know who we're offending, and that's why you had the J.K. Rowling situation. She just didn't realise. So now we're in a position where we can't support a woman and a feminist because she, in quotes, is transphobic. And Mm. that is baffling for somebody of my age. One of the situations that we have, obviously, is the constant reworking of terminology. So what was an acceptable phrase to use, say, 10 years ago, and even a supportive phrase to use, is now seen as essentially hate speech. Oh, well, my goodness, yes, yes. And uh, there was an example of that on uh, television on Saturday because they screened a documentary uh, about James Baldwin called I Am Not Your Negro. Mm. And the word is in the film throughout. And on IMDb, somebody has counted the number of times that Negro is used. Why is that necessary? Because... It's now hate speech, Mm. and it's extraordinary because when I was growing up, it was a term of politeness. You didn't use the word black um, because that was offensive, and so we have gone from one extreme to the other. And that's that's fascinating, isn't it? How has that come about? It's interesting because it's, you know, a cynical person might say that there are people out there just determined to rework things in order to trip 
particularly say older generations up because it's very hard to keep up with. There was the, the famous case, I guess, a few years ago when um, was it Benedict Cumberbatch referred to coloured people rather than saying mm. people of colour because you know he it's yeah. probably that was the polite phrase when he was growing up. And uh, yes, most certainly, and 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 his class would have used uh, mm. coloured uh, all the time. They never would have used uh, the word black. Um, And there's a a, a reference to that in a Johnny Spate play, I think, called, um, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's something like if blacks didn't exist, you'd have to invent them. And Mm. the use of black in the title of a television program in, and I'm guessing it would have been the early 60s, was tremendously shocking. Um, Mm. Johnny Spate who, as you know, wrote um, Sylvester Two Part, was really pushing the boundaries there. Hard to explain that to kids now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the, tra- the, tran- the trans situation does seem to particularly, as you say, it's the, the number one hot potato. And it's kind of interesting, I guess, from, from the point of view of somebody who's campaigned against censorship and in favour of... I say in favour of porn, for want of a better phrase, that I know. <laughs> suddenly that the radical feminists who were very much in favour of closing down any kind of sexually explicit material are now suddenly becoming the champions of free speech. <laughs> yes, crazy times. How has it come about? I haven't analysed it. Um, it. I can't yeah. give you the answer to uh, well, have you got one? I throw it back at you. I have, I have no idea. I mean, I think there's a certain degree of power play going on in the sense that people want to either build careers or build reputations by being the the loudest voice of the oppressed, even if they're not actually part of that group. And and one good way of doing that, of course, is to trample on those who came before you. So, you know, you push them out of the way. It's very manipulative and very cynical in that way, I think. I think you, you could be right, yes. This is, this is all about uh, shaming now, isn't it? Ultimately, does it all lead to economics? Is there money to be made out of this uh, this kind of shaming? Because it would account for everything. Can you, as you say, advance your career successfully if you adopt this kind of attitude? Can you sell more books? I must you, admit... You could, you could write books about it. So. <laughs> that too, yes, yes. Um, that could be a reason. Yeah, and I think also lots of people genuinely seem to want to take on collective guilt for what previous generations have done. I mean, they need to atone. I'm sure that for a lot of people, that's a very genuine, genuine need, whether it's the right thing to do or not is a different matter. But I'm not saying that people are not genuine in their beliefs and that kind of thing. Well, you're you're talking essentially about white people's guilt here. And uh, yes, it's it's eating us up at the moment. I mean, that's why we're talking about this. It is it is a concern um, to me. You know, what can I say? I don't want to get into offence because um, I think it's extremely important to offend people just to wake them up. But at the moment, and let's face it, it is mostly white people involved. It, it, it's mostly pulling down statues. Let's face it, at least that's what it looked like on the on the video. So this is another issue as well, you know, trying to, oh, forgive the term, whitewash the past in, mm. in the hope that that will make us white people feel better. Mm. But it's... You know, it's a sticking plaster, isn't it? It's just covering up something that you don't like the look of. Of course it is, yes. I mean, unless you lived in Bristol, you would never have heard of this person. Um, mm. I, I know his name now, Colston. <laughs> I didn't realise it was all over Bristol. You know, I've played the Colston Hall, but I didn't mm. know that's who he was. And so now his, his name is being removed from, well, I think it's already gone from Colston Hall being removed from uh, street names as well but yes is 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 that the right way to go i've got nothing against it it seemed like a great day out to pull a statue (laughs) down and chuck it in the river i mean that that appeals to my um sense of rebellion of course they looked at least as though they were all having a great day yeah i guess one aspect of this is without wanting to try to belittle what 
might be genuine anger. I think the very fact that we've all been locked in for three months oh. has certainly certainly helped encourage people to want to get out and protest more. <laughs> oh dear, we're going. I never thought that this conversation. <laughs> would be so controversial uh, dave we're getting into such sensitive areas here and we i are. thought we, we were just are. we were just going to talk about tits and bums we can't stop now we we've, we've got to go ahead um it it occurred to me that there is a connection between um the riots and the demonstrations that are happening all over the world uh, there's a connection between those and, and lockdown. There has to be, because it was a way of getting out of the house. Am I uh, simplifying things here? No, I think that, that makes perfect sense. I think also it's, you know, people will actually have very built-up frustrations and the tension of being locked in. So their, their emotions are probably heightened more as well. I think so, yes. Um, and I, I wondered where it was going to lead. I think it's relatively healthy because if you read any science fiction novel about uh, post-apocalyptic life, it, 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 we're taught that it, it leads to looting and that is the <laughs> one thing that we haven't had and there seems to be no desire to loot not mm. even in america so instead i mean it seems like a rather jolly alternative doesn't it to go out and pull down a, a, a statue of apparently no artistic merit um, mm. dedicated to somebody you've never heard of and push it in the water. What's wrong <laughs> with that? I've got nothing against it at all, I have to say. But mm. I wondered if it would lead on to more extreme forms of censorship because, you know, now they're talking about all the statues <laughs> that have mm. to be removed. This, this is, I suppose, this is where it gets slightly worrying that they move on from to statues to books to, oh. to films, as we're seeing. I mean, obviously, people, I'm sure, people will be immediately be turning around and saying, "Well, of course, they haven't banned these films or these TV shows; they've just removed them from certain platforms." But you know, it's still, that it's is, still an act of censorship. Yes, which, which of course, both of us are, have always been against, and 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 that's why we're having this this conversation. Yes, it's it's symbolic. It it mm. probably means nothing, but, uh, well, I suppose the first thing everybody said uh, who is uh, is against censorship is, oh, are we going to start burning books next? Because mm. a case can be made for that. There's a, there's a statue outside Broadcasting House in London, and it's by a sculptor called Eric Gill, <laughs> and you probably know that he's now been well a long time ago he was exposed as a paedophile and mm. there have been court calls for that to be removed now that is another matter because it's a work of art and mm. if we're going to start destroying works of art then what's the difference between us and the taliban and what they did in palmyra now that's what we ought to be talking about no, I agree. I think it's that it's that very difficult point. Where do you stop? Where do you draw the line? And uh, and of course you can't because if you've got that mindset, then you could uh, sweep history clean, couldn't you? The the there would be statues to virtually nobody, in, including um, this conversation we had the day before yesterday. I said, well. Um, what statues um, should we have instead of these old slave traders? Oh, I know, Eric Morecambe. Okay, his name's come <laughs> up before in the in this conversation, and and somebody mm. pointed out then, um, no, there's a, a sketch that Morecambe and Wise did, in which they're in the kitchen and making their breakfast in time to a piece of music. But I'm afraid that some of the activities they involve themselves in during that sketch are now racist. No. So, you know, let's, um, I don't want to go into what they are, but, you know, Eric Morecambe's statue in Morecambe is going to have to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's Cra yeah. crazy times. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting that I noticed that one of the films that Sky now have their warning on the front of was Aladdin from 2019, saying that this film contains outdated attitudes. Mm. It's like, it's from a year ago! <laughs> you know, it's like, you know have we literally gone to a year zero. <laughs> it feels like it sometimes, uh, doesn't it? Just remind me, um, what's outdated in that version of Aladdin? I know there was trouble with the cartoon version. And lyrics were rewritten. It's, I, I imagine it's it's much the same thing. I mean, it's I don't know. It's, it's Western filmmakers making a film about a culture that isn't their own. I don't know. I, to be fair, I haven't seen it, so it could have some wildly I, I, offensive stuff in. <laughs> uh, I haven't either, but okay, I can imagine uh, what it might be. Yes, but it's it's interesting because. Of course, as you know, what was acceptable yesterday is not acceptable today and, and vice versa. So, mm. you know, all the people who are being very judgmental at the moment probably don't realize because I guess, you know, this is the first time that they've had to deal with this kind of thing. That in 10 years time, it could be them. It could be something they've said, some words they've used. Yes. Uh, hadn't, uh, hadn't there been examples of that? Um, you know, uh, people who, who stand up and make proclamations. This is why I'm very careful mm. not to do this kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and, and then they're, they're hoist with their own petard because somebody mentions a, a tweet that uh, mm. they wrote 12 years ago. Um, I think, yeah, not, that's not the interesting thing. Talking. I mean, it's that, it's that whole point of, particularly now with social media, I guess, that you do need to have led a completely blameless life and never said anything wrong or or dubious or made a, an off-colour joke because you can't then turn around and take the moral high ground because there'll be somebody who will, from from either side of the political spectrum, somebody will then go through everything you've ever said and they do seem to have infinite amounts of time to do this looking for <laughs> one statement. <laughs> it's probably better just yes. to be wildly offensive all the time and... I think I think so. Yes, yes. Uh, it's all out there. Um, if you haven't removed it, then it's there for everyone to see. And if if you're a politician, yes, your entire history has to be as as pure as the driven snow, uh, with, without a doubt. Um, I try not to make political statements. I mean, um, this is the turn up for me. I tell you, um, because who knows what if indeed anyone is listening, who knows what people are going to challenge me with, something that I've forgotten I said or wrote uh, mm. 20 years ago, which now contradicts what I'm saying uh, right this minute. I have to say, you know, my, my conscience is, as far as I'm aware, clear. You know, I don't think I've said anything racist sexist or homophobic in my entire life now how about that for a statement do you want to now whoever you are go <laughs> go online and prove me wrong well it's, i suppose the other point as well with, with you is that your life particularly now now that you have your autobiography out is is an open book you've confessed to all sorts of disgraceful behavior and <laughs> so you know, how can you be shamed it was uh um a, a ploy of mine uh yes i thought i'll say everything myself and then nobody can throw anything at me uh we're, we're talking about a book called little did you know um let's get a plug in for it um of course. Uh, yes it was um it, it was a, a wonderful experience to to set it all down in in print and uh come clean although perhaps that's not the right word yes <laughs> i i i recommend it um to everyone it's uh, it's it's a very freeing experience because i was terribly uptight about everything when i was a boy i didn't want anyone to know anything for various reasons but all oh, the sense of liberation i can't speak highly enough about it and yeah i guess if you if you expose yourself nobody else can expose you can they yeah yeah and you can tell what you think is the truth and um you know i i, I didn't want to die and then for somebody to get it all wrong and tell, tell lies about <laughs> me I thought, i'll tell the truth now 
because um, uh, it, it, it's so apparent to me that if you spend your life um, covering something up, um, that the minute you die, it will be revealed, and then that's all people will remember you for. So, yeah. I mean, there's so many examples of this, but the, the, the best of all for me is Edgar Hoover. You know, <laughs> who's, you know what I'm going to say. But he, he spent all his adult life as the, the head of the FBI. Now, does anyone remember that now? As soon as you see Edgar Hoover come up on your screen, you think, oh, transvestite. <laughs> He was just ahead of the curve. <laughs> well, you know, far from it, because he was so closeted, and now everybody knows that. So the whole thing mm. was completely pointless. He could have come out, <laughs> so to speak, at the beginning of his FBI career and said, I love dressing up in women's clothes. And everyone would have said, oh, Edgar, marvellous. Well, they wouldn't perhaps in those days. It was probably illegal in the States. But mm. how sad, you know, that people spend their lives covering something up and then everything goes from one extreme to the other after they die. So I, I, I didn't want that, no. No, well, that's good. But <laughs> let's, let's talk about Trouser Bar for a minute. I want to, uh, okay. I'm intrigued by Trouser Bar the Musical. And I'll add in when I when I post this uh, this podcast, I'll add links to to the book and to trouser bar so people can familiarise themselves with with your work. But trouser bar the musical, how's this how's this possibly going to work? Well, how kind of you to mention it. Um, uh, well, is it going to work? We've no idea because n nobody knows when when theatres will reopen, and that's that's the yeah. end of that. However. I made a short film, a silent film called called Trouser Bar, and uh, it went all over the world. And I had great fun introducing it in 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 other countries. And uh, that lasted for about a year. That was a wonderful year. And then I thought, oh well, that's the end of that. Mm -hmm. Last summer, I was at a, a garden party, and the man opposite me at the table uh, said oh trouser bar how about making it into a musical and i loved the idea straight away he's a, a composer uh, i thought i'd never hear anything about it again but exactly a year later we have a, a, a lyricist and a director and we've just got the first draft of the book and uh, i love it it's great i'm in it as a as a character it's not just trouser bar the musical of course because that was a 20 minute film but this is a musical about how that film came to be made and it's a, a tribute uh, ah. to peter de rome the pioneer right. erotic filmmaker who should have made trouser bar but i couldn't persuade him and then he died and so i thought well i'll make it myself and uh, that's the story of that. Who would have thought that that would come up? That was a delightful surprise. That makes a lot more sense. I was just wondering how you could stretch that 20 minutes of, um, <laughs> of naked men <laughs> having sex yes. into, a, into a theatrical performance. I mean, I'm sure you could if you, if you put your mind to it. Um, no, you couldn't, in all honesty, uh, Dave. No, that would have been impossible. So we've got a long, long build-up. Um, it's like the foreplay, really. And then uh, part of Trouser Bar is staged <laughs> live. And I, it, you know, it'll be a production number. You know, there'll be people singing and dancing. So I can't wait to see that. <laughs> Neither can I. That sounds sounds extraordinary. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll see you there. If we can get it on stage, who knows? Well, as you say, I mean, if the theatre's staying closed until next year and i guess lots of places are still in that limbo situation so we don't even know how many places will still be around do we how true yes o already um some theaters have gone into liquidation they're not reopening um you know what will 
regional theatre be like? I, I have no idea because a lot more will, will never reopen. And it's hard to imagine if social distancing stays in place, how any theatre could ever reopen because um, some people have done the feasibility study and if they have to take out seats, which they are doing in Germany, I gather, um, mm. they will place half empty houses at every performance and they cannot break even. There's just no way. So the only way they can do it is with government subsidy. Now, you know, mm. you know what the government's like with arts funding. Are they really yeah. going to make a priority of giving theatres money when we have so many other things to worry about? It seems so unlikely, which is, again, depressing. Mm. I mean, it's, it, it does seem that once things get back to whatever whatever the new normal turns out to be, that you know we're gonna we're gonna have this huge financial crash coming because if governments, as they keep telling us, don't have that much money and they've just been spending like crazy with this, so I guess we're gonna have to put all pay back in one way or another. Yes, where is the money coming from? We're in what is it more debt now than we've ever been since the nineteen sixties. I mean, I you never so. know what, what to believe because n n nobody knows anything and we are still being fed a lot of lies. But mm. yes, I don't know how we're going to get out of that debt. I presume we're going to have to borrow even more money from China. <laughs> oh. Yes. Is that going to work out? I don't know. And that's assuming that course you know we don't get a second wave well that's the the, the next thing to discuss isn't it yes mm. um but i get i well, guess if we can if we can take something as a little side benefit of all the protests is that if we don't have a huge resurgence in the next week or two then we know that it really is diminishing because obviously people haven't been social distancing they've been out together they've been breaking all the rules so if we don't have an upheaval then i guess then coronavirus really is on the way out. Yes, that is how it's looking. Yes, we'll know very, very soon. And um, if if we can learn um, from history, then that seems to have been what happened with so-called Spanish flu a hundred years mm. ago. The, sec the second wave was worse than the first, but that was because apparently Armistice Day came along, everybody went out onto the streets, <laughs> they were hugging and kissing, the pubs were full, and then they started getting sick two weeks later. So th there's no question about why that happened. Now, is that going to happen again this time? Uh, time will tell. How are you finding this new way of working? Well, it's no substitute, is it? Um, but... Mm. Now, we all have to adapt. Uh, like everyone, I'd never heard of Zoom three months mm. ago. Now I'm on it every day. Um, uh, and we had a, um, a script reading of my screenplay for the wrong people on Zoom with a, with a cast of 15. But I would have done more research um, had I known because, you know, unless everybody's got... Um, the right internet connection and perfect lighting and Dolby mm. sound, the, the, the results are not good. And um, mm. it's, it, it, it's, in, it's an imperfect technology at the moment. I mean, it's quite exciting to be, yeah. to be part of it in the, in the early days, really. I'm sure we'll tell our grandchildren, oh, yes, I remember uh, Zoom. Yes, the pictures <laughs> used to freeze. And then, <laughs> and then you couldn't hear what people were saying because they all spoke at once. It'll be a, it'll be a joke. Mm. Um, so it's, it's quite an honour to be, to be part of this. But you know, I personally, I would still rather be round a pub table, um, yeah. with real people, and I'm sure you would too. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think you know, I'm quite missing pubs and I'm looking at the idea of pubs opening and part of me is really keen for it to happen and the other part is thinking, what will it be like and what will people be like? You know, will there be people running around licking everything and touching everything and being <laughs> horribly infectious or will we all have to sit in these little bubbles? And 
I'm just not sure how it, much it's appealing to me at the moment. Well, under, under those circumstances, nobody would go to a pub. Um, mm. Bookshops bookshops have opened, and apparently if mm. you take a book off the shelf, I mean, again, you've probably heard this, I'm not telling you anything, but if you take a book off the shelf, you can't put it back again. You have to put it in a separate pile because it has to be sanitized. Mm. Now... Are people going to go to bookshops under these circumstances? Again, time will tell. Um, will people go to pubs if they can only go in the beer garden and sit with their uh, uh, two friends at one table, two meters from other friends? Can that work? I bet they're trying to work out if, if it can. Oh, I, I think lots of them are looking at different at different ways of doing it but i'm not i haven't seen anything that, that sounds really realistic in terms of social engagement i mean it's interesting that you were saying about bookshops because i think it's also that thing of getting people used to new habits because i know that we went to buy some food in um, mns last week and you'll pick a packet of something up and look at it mm. and then just put it back down as you would normally and then mm. later on you're thinking hang on was that a bad thing to do <laughs> i know it's, it's is this allowed? There's no, there's no signs telling you that you can't do this. So mm. is this something that people, the authorities, have forgotten? You know, uh, and, and if it is, then maybe we should address ourselves to that. You know, if you, you can't pick something up and put it back again. <sighs> yeah, it's just all, it's all very strange. Who knows where, where will nobody all end knows. up? No, nobody knows. Anyway. But I, I, I try to remain optimistic. That's all I can say. Well, good. Well, on that note, let's uh, mm. let's wind this up on a on a positive note. You know, we've we've got a yes, bright please. future to look forward to, and we can all we can all sit there in the pub in six months' time laughing about this. I'm sure. I'll I'll enjoy meeting you in the pub, um, Dave. It's been a great pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much, and I'll speak to you soon.